Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to Sydney TV Season 2, Episode 10. So we have finally come to the end of this season, Season 2. And I have to say that it's been a great uh, season this this time. We have a lot of great guests coming on, talking about um, what happened during COVID-19. How can we better navigate during turbulent times like this? So it's been a great, great season. And unfortunately, this is our last episode. But don't be too sad because we'll be back. Uh, something's brewing and we'll let you know when the time comes. Now, before I get started for all my viewers here who have been watching Sydney TV for a while now, uh, this next slide should be no should be no uh, no surprise to you. So, if you have any questions during the live show, whether is it now or nearing or in the middle of a sharing session or even during the Q and A, all you need to do is head on to our Sydney TV season two episode ten topic page, as you can see here. And all you need to do is to click on ask a question and you'll see this question box pop up at the side. So if you want to ask a question anonymously, feel free to do so. If you're a bit paisi, a bit shy, right? You can ask your questions anonymously. If not, you can leave your name in there. That's totally fine. But of course, we want to see your name so that I can address it to you uh, nicely as well. So just a reminder, anytime during the live show, you can do that. So feel free to ask your questions already. Okay, so for this episode, um, as uh, you would already know to tuning into this show, that it's all about how we can navigate like a, a tough job market, especially since uh, COVID-19 has caused, you know, retrenchments and higher unemployment rates. So um, at the if we are actually um so actually here at Sydney we created a career assistant package and this is basically a compilation of all the relevant resources and content that we tap on our partners from the personal finance space to actually create content that will be able to be beneficial to you will, will be able to help you uh you know if you are looking for a job in your job seeking journey or even or for your career in general. So if you are a new user, all you need to do is to sign up for a free Sidley account. If you are an existing user, you just have to log into your account. And after that, just be active. You know, you can ask, you can discuss and share your thoughts by answering a question, for example. Uh, you can leave a comment, you can write a review, you can ask a question, and the list goes on because we have a lot of things going on on our web. So take a look and make sure you're active because once you, once you do that, that's where we will send you uh, an email with our career assistant package. So if you do this between now to 12 July, you will be eligible for it. But do be active because that's when we will then send it to you via um, an email. And if you are wondering where can I actually check Sidley out, here's the link that I've provided at the bottom. So that's where you can start uh, finding more about what Sidley does, uh, what kind of content that we create. Okay, so um, maybe before I start, I'll just like to share um, the the current situation that I think a lot of us are very familiar with. But um, you know, how can we then navigate um, a time a time like this, which is really the focus of this episode? So we've seen in the headlines, uh, Singapore's jobless rate highest in ten years. You know, compared to the past, and then a uh, total unemployment rate also shrank by tw over twenty five thousand, and that is the biggest decline quarterly that we've seen um, in, 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 in our past uh, decade. So this is uh, worrying trends that we are seeing as well as the stats are not very are not very good for someone who is you know actively looking for a job. You know, and we've seen and according to you know a, a, a really a, a statistics released by the government, the ratio of job vacancies to unemployed persons is 0 0.71. So this also means that um, for seven job seekers uh, if there are 10, 10 jobs available, um, the, the chances of seven getting employed successfully is quite bleak. So this is something that uh, you know, we'll see may, may even increase over um, the next few months. So something that we all, I think, is good to know. How can we actually prepare for, let's say, when a time like this really do come? So, you know, over the four budgets, uh, you should already know that we have four budgets and out of the 93 billion pumped across these four budgets, 80% is used to preserve jobs and businesses. So, you know, on one end, we have like the government helping, you know, um, businesses to, you know, stay, stay, stay operational, help them in their finances. On the other hand, it's really to help job seekers or job workers like myself uh, to be able to keep our jobs and hopefully from this uh, budget releases that these gov the government have is actually to help businesses so then on our part you know we, we have support from let's say um, government authorities but then what can we do on our own end then that's really the question that we should think about because uh, there's only so much 
we can benefit or really sustain in the long run um, with all these tangible monetary benefits. Okay, so what does this mean for me is really the main crux of this whole episode. And that's when I actually want to bring in my guest for this episode. So let me introduce um, my first guest first. He is Chong Yi, the co-founder and director of the Todd Collective. Hi, Chong Yi. Let me add you in. Wait, give me a sec. <laughs> give me a sec. Give me a sec. Okay, there we go. Hi. Hi, Chong Yi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm quite exhausted. I uh, had a super long day today. So I'm like, oh, just let this end. <laughs> but yes. You know, like, hey, yeah, was, he just started. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but he is a very busy man because every time I call him, right, I have a feeling that he's driving. Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, often. <laughs> So yeah, so it's very hard to catch him. Um, so I'm very, very glad that we actually got him this time. So thanks for joining us. Let me invite my next guest. Uh, his do his go Tuokeng. He is the special projects lead at Glins. Hi, hi Tuokeng. Oops. Tuokeng, I think you need to unmute yourself. Hey Clara, yeah, sorry. Here we go. Uh, standard uh, Zoom issue. <laughs> Hey, thanks for joining us for today. I can't wait to share with the rest as well what awesome research that Glins has done. Uh, my last guest for today is Geraldine. She is a member of our Sydney community. Hi, Geraldine. Hey, hi, Clara. Thanks for having me on this show. Hey, thanks again, uh, all of you, for actually joining us uh, for this episode. Um, so before we, we we get into, let's say, our our discussions, let, let, let's let start with uh, uh, a sharing by Glynn. So Glynn's actually did a lot of research um, on what the, the macro trends of the job market is currently in APEC um, and Singapore, as well as uh, what are some things that job seekers can do now. So without further ado, I'll just uh, let uh, Tongyi talk to Okan take away. Awesome. Thanks, Clara. Uh, maybe just to give a brief introduction of Glintz. Uh, Glintz is the number one talent and recruitment platform in Southeast Asia. We're currently in five markets. So the markets are Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Um, for today, I think uh, we'll be talking about two main topics. The first is the macro trends in the job market. I think everyone has an impression that the job market is very badly hit. And, and that is true to a certain extent but we're also seeing early signs of recovery. So that's really the first topic. And the second topic we wanna to briefly touch on is what you can do now, knowing that uh, a job recovery, uh, early, there are signs of early recovery in the job market. So let's uh, dive straight into the job trends. And I wanna start with the, the first market, which is China. Um, this might look like quite a complex slide. Uh, so let me break it down at the, at the, at the for, at the background, you can actually see uh, the gray bars and they actually represent the number of uh, daily number of uh, COVID cases. And the yellow bars represent the change in the number of jobs in the economy. So in this case, you can see that the daily number of cases of COVID actually peaked in February. And that was when the biggest contraction happened. Um, but after February, you can see that there is actually an expansion in the number of jobs. So after the worst, uh, after the, the number of jobs strength the most in February, afterwards, it was a general recovery trend. Let's go to the next slide. So it's the same trend in South Korea, where the peak number of cases happened in the month of March. And that was when the biggest contraction also happened in the month of March. In April, there was also a contraction, but it was less severe. And after April, it's a general recovery trend as well. Next slide. The next slide is on Hong Kong. So the peak number of cases in Hong Kong happened uh, late March and the biggest contraction actually happened in April. So again, the same trend holds. May there was a contraction, but it was a smaller contraction compared to April. And then afterwards it's a general recovery trend. So we have looked at several markets. Let's look at Singapore. Um, Singapore, unfortunately, they do not disclose uh, monthly employment statistics. So we look internally at Glints within our database. Um, for Singapore, the peak number of cases happened in April. And that was where we saw the greatest uh, dip in the number of job posting on our Glints platform. And as a result, you can actually see that uh, the biggest contraction kind of holds 
with the same trend that we saw just now. And the biggest contraction happened in the month where there was the peak number of COVID cases. But very rapidly in the month of May, you can see that the number of job postings actually recovered to a year-to-date high. Yeah. So beyond the Glint's uh, platform, we also see uh, there was also a recent survey that was conducted. So recent meaning uh, June, which is this month. And this was a survey that was conducted with over 200 employers. And many of them actually report that they expect hiring levels to return to pre-COVID levels. And if we go to the next slide, actually 86% of hiring managers actually think uh, it will return to pre-COVID level. So pretty fast. So I think the bottom line is, if we go one more slide, that hiring freezes are not permanent and that job opportunities for job seekers will eventually return. Now, your next question might be, you know, which are the sectors that are recovering? So again, when we look at our internal Glynn's platform, we see that there are four key areas where there is a lot of uh, active job postings. So the four key areas are BD and sales, software engineering, marketing, as well as finance. But what's more interesting is if we go to the next slide, that there are several fast improving sectors. So hospitality and tourism or travel actually has the biggest month-on-month uh, -month improvement. Obviously, this is because April, they had a very bad month, a very small base as well. But this is a good sign that there is some recovery happening even in the hospitality industry. Besides hospitality, we are also seeing strong growth in education, product management and marketing roles as well. Next slide. Yeah, so I think this concludes the, the first part of my sharing. And that is that, you know, the job market has definitely been hit. I think Clara shared some top line uh, headline statistics, but internally and even in the region, we are starting to see early signs of recovery. So the next question would then be, what can you do now as a job seeker? And this is really the second part of the presentation. Um, and we have three tips. The first is really to start preparing for your interview right now. If we go to the next slide. So to prepare for your interview, I think it's important to first adjust your expectations. Uh, we have three tips here. The first is uh, more of a heads up, which is competition can be extremely stiff in the current environment. Um, Clara also mentioned at the start of the presentation that uh, it's currently an employer market where there are more job seekers than there are jobs available. So competition will be tough. Um, secondly, it's about preparation and starting early. We, we, if you are looking for a job now, I, we will strongly urge you to start early and also be patient. Typically, the recruitment cycle will be three to six months, uh, but we expect this to be either on the longer end or even longer due to uh, the COVID situation. Um, the last, the last thing we want to share is that it's okay to actually uh, be open to applying to other industries. In fact, we are seeing due to, compared to pre-COVID levels, a lot of job seekers are actually more likely to apply to industry, uh, to jobs in different industries. So this is uh, the baselining of the expectations. Besides, uh, now, that, now that we're kind of on the same page, I think uh, I also want to flag out several uh, community resources that can actually help you in your job search journey and also your placement journey. So full disclosure, uh, these two social organizations, I'm actually personally involved in them. The, the first is advisory. Um, and I think uh, they focus a lot on the youth. Uh, they, they have two programs that, are, that I personally think are really great. The first is the mentorship program where they pair students from polytechnic students all the way to undergraduates uh, with industry mentors. So students can get direct exposure to the kind of uh, industry professionals that they want to meet and to learn more about the particular industry of choice. Um, the second thing that I, the second program that they run that I find very interesting is also the Discover Plus series, where they invite different speakers to share about their opinions about the industry. So it's a great platform for students and even non-students, even PMATs, to understand about the new, uh, to, to understand about the industries that they are interested in. The second organization is uh, Career Socials. So Career Socials is a social enterprise that focuses a lot on personal branding. So if you are in need of a uh, new resume or if you want a interview partner, you can reach out to Career Socials and they can pair you up with uh, a branding buddy 
uh, which is kind of a, either a, a resume writer or a practitioner, a HR practitioner that can help you practice your uh, interview skills. Beyond that, they have also launched a uh, resume and interview e-lecture, which is currently free. Uh, and you can learn several tips uh, on crafting a resume as well as uh, learning a, a, a tip or two on interview skills. So these are the two social organizations that might help you in the preparation for your interview journey. Um, the, the, second, the second actionable for all job seekers would be actually to focus on upskilling as well as uh, taking relevant online courses. So there's a very interesting statistic in the next slide, which is uh, within Udemy, they're actually seeing a 400 plus percent increase in the number of enrollments and the number of students. Um, and a lot of these uh, enrollments, if we go to the next slide, are focused on three key areas. So soft skills, technical skills, as well as uh, tips to help you work from home. So these are some you know, pretty popular courses uh, on the Udemy platform. But besides Udemy, if we go to the next slide, there are also many, many online platforms that can help uh, current job seekers uh, to really upskill and learn new things. So maybe on the online course uh, platform, I just want to call Linda, where if you're an NLB member, you can actually access uh, some of the courses uh, completely for free. Um, there, within the funding channel, I think uh, uh, a lot of Singaporeans should be familiar with the Skills Future um, scheme. And there has recently been a top up, so all Singaporeans can actually, uh, all eligible Singaporeans can actually learn new things uh, using the Skills Future credit. And the last, the last column, which is on virtual internships, I think is very relevant for current undergraduates. Uh, there's a company called Insight Sherpa where you, you can actually learn several things. Uh, you can actually take on a virtual internship and you can gain exposure to some of these uh, partnership companies. So it's kind of like a taste of, of the job, but uh, it, everything is online and everything is virtual. So these are some online platforms that can help you upskill as well as learn new things. The last, uh, the last sectionable that we want to share at Glintz, it's also now is the best time and now is the time to really start applying for opportunities. So if we go to the next slide, for fresh graduates, I think uh, the government has launched the SG United Traineeship Program. And that's a program that's really targeted at students, graduating students from ITE to polytechnics to universities. They, there, there are currently more than uh, 500 approved companies already, and there will be many more that will be progressively posting job openings on the my my careers my futures on on the my career future uh, website. So that is a website that I think all undergraduates uh, and all uh, graduates uh, in the current environment should check out. And there are several benefits uh, to taking on such a temporary job. Uh, firstly, it's about helping you improve your future employability. Uh, there, there might be also the chance of conversion if you if you take up a, a contract. Again, this is very dependent on company, but give, giving yourself that uh, opportunity will, will really help you improve your future employability. The second thing is it really gives you um, exposure to different industries, giving you a hands-on experience in some of the industries of your choice. And the last thing is that it, it gives you uh, in, an income stream. It gives you... Uh, uh, pretty good pocket money. I think for the undergraduates, uh, the range, the pay range is anywhere between one point eight thousand to two point five thousand a month. So, these are some of the benefits of taking on uh, SG United Traineeship Program. If we go to the next slide, yeah. If we go, uh, so this slide describes uh, that there are more opportunities. There are also support schemes and all that if you're not a fresh graduate. So fresh graduate in that column, you can see uh, that there is the SG United Traineeship Program. For people in the junior level all the way to the senior level, there are initiatives like the Rank and File Place and Train Program, as well as various career transition uh, programs. Uh, a lot of these uh, information can actually be found on the WSG or E2I website. So I urge uh, most of the, I urge uh, job seekers to, to visit those websites and find out more. Um, besides uh, the government initiatives, I think Glintz has a platform. If we go to the next slide. The Glintz as a platform is also a, another opportunity for job seekers to actually look for jobs. Um, you can create a profile on Glintz 
and our recruiters will reach out and try and place you in the most relevant jobs. So those are the, the three key actionables that I think we want to share for the second part of, of uh, the sharing. Yeah, I see everyone is back on the screen. Claire, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I am. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Duokong, thanks for sharing. So now is the time where we actually uh, can weigh in on whatever that uh, Duokong has shared. So I mm. personally have a question. So, um, you know, at Glint, you are a talent recruitment and a career discovery platform. So right. every day you see job applicants coming in, applying for jobs, and you also see a lot that fall through the cracks. So my question is, um, how what what are some criteria or let's say checkboxes that uh, employers look out for when they hire someone, or and also when someone you say you know what I think this person doesn't make the cut because that is really like the first even before any interviews like looking at whatever they've sent is already the first barrier to getting employed. Mm, got it. I think. Uh... <laughs> It, it really varies from job seeker to job seeker. So maybe I can categorize it into two categories. The first being uh, fresh graduates and the second being uh, non-fresh graduates. For fresh graduates, I think uh, employers are looking out for a couple of uh, key things. The first is, you know, your your academics, so your GPA, things like mm. that. Uh, not, not all employers look out for that, but this is just a broad generalization. Uh, so academics is one. Second thing is your school experience. So how active were you in school? What CCAs did you participate in? How relevant would those be in your current job, for example? And the last thing is actually uh, your internship experience. If you have had a banking internship, it's a lot easier to break into the banking industry. So I think for fresh graduates, that would be the three main criteria. And for the non-fresh graduates, I think it becomes a little bit more uh, murky because uh, different employers really have different uh, asks and it's uh, it's uh, it's hard to nail it down to a couple of, uh, it's hard to nail it down to several factors. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Uh, any any abnormal uh, abnormalities during a time like this, during COVID-19, in terms of, let's say, what employers look out for in their first criteria uh, when sieving through job applicants? Hmm. I think what a lot of uh, hiring managers are feeling now is, it's not so much, uh, th there's no big change. The only change or rather the biggest change is that they are more cautious about hiring now because they don't know how the business environment will change. They don't know whether their revenues will be severely affected. So they want to be more cautious. And as a result, we are seeing recruitment cycles take longer. So from the average of three to six months to maybe slanting more towards five plus all the way to six plus, seven plus months. So that is the, the biggest shift we are, we are, we are kind of seeing. Um, but but beyond, in, in terms of like the criteria they are looking out for, it's, it, 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 there's no big change. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Uh, hmm. Tongi, Jaredin, anything you'd like to weigh in? Mm, not in, no, not at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Jaredin, moment. anything for you? Okay. Not if not... I'll just move on to our next part of the slides. So this is where now I get uh, Tongi to actually share a little bit. So give, uh, Tongi, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so let's go. <laughs> All right. Hi. Uh, just to give some caveats first before I begin, right? Um, it's really hard. Uh, I've actually done this presentation in response to actually four main questions that were asked uh, on the platforms uh, that there was available by Sydney. And uh, I organized the questions in a way that actually will somehow make some sort of uh, sense uh, as we begin to go through this, these ideas. But I want to just say that um, because we're speaking to a really broad audience, I have no idea what circumstance diversity you guys are part of. And uh, I'd like to maybe beforehand apologize ahead of time if the responses are a bit too broad. And if anyway itself, right, they show the sensitivity itself with the circumstances situation you're in. Um, I say that quite importantly because I'm very aware of how much more diversity there is in Singapore. So general, you know, rules and tips over uh, how to get hired or what you can do or things like that, I, I, I'm concerned that, that uh, they really may not really meet you where you are. So I'll be happy later on during the Q&A to take whatever questions you guys might have and I could maybe begin to address a bit more with uh, a bit more address a bit more granularity there. So for now, these are uh, broad principles I'd like to go through. 
So in doing so over here, what happens is that I like to first just give some context over my own career and work so that you understand where I'm coming from and maybe the possible biases that I have uh, when I'm speaking about these particular things. My general work actually is with human systems. So I do a lot of work primarily with uh, companies, boards, you know, um, communities. And my work is really around learning about these communities, how they behave, how do we change uh, behavior, how do we improve trust, things like that. Uh, I do so across all levels of the system, um, which means, sorry, that I work with uh, sometimes marriages or couples or families, or sometimes I work with entire um, precincts, right? And in doing this work, I think it's given us a very good understanding itself of human systems and how human systems operate and, and move. So what pays me essentially is social entrepreneurship. Uh, I run one of the largest social enterprise groups in the country. Uh, also, I have the privilege of sitting on quite a few boards uh, in the country, which look at, I think, different areas like, in terms of Singapore's development. Um, so I'll be happy to sort of take all these particular questions, but that's largely what the context is. I'm more on the social sector side than the private sector. Okay. So uh, let's start with the first question. What do job seekers need to know about the current job market? Um, what to listen out for and how to adapt to the current crisis? I remember when I first looked at this question, I really jumped straight at the word adapt. Um, so I'm going to offer three responses to this question and hopefully they can offer you some insights right, over how we're seeing it. Okay. So I'm just going to let you read first. What I'm concerned about, right, in the question, in what to listen out for and how to adapt to the current crisis is that um, a, lot, a lot of job seekers today are looking to try and um, restore some level of prediction or some level of control. Um, typically, within crisis situations, human beings jump straight into a need to control or a need to predict. And this is to remove a lot of uncertainty in which they're experiencing. And inevitably, in panels like this, I think it is quite understandable someone jumps in and says, please tell me the answers. The trouble with that is that um, there's a mis huge misunderstanding of the situation. The trouble with the crisis is that this is actually, at least for this generation, an unprecedented crisis. We have never had a health crisis, an economic crisis, a social crisis, and a political crisis, essentially all happening at the same time. It has never been at this scale, at this speed, and with no real solution in sight. And you're seeing yourself right, from day to day, uh, different countries itself are, are really thrown into all levels of turmoil. And as the you know, uh, token has said earlier, uh, this is really something where even the stock markets, the employers, they're all uncertain. So the belief over here or the illusion is that somebody can come to you as an expert and tell you that they are able to tell you what's going on in the future. And the truth is, I, I doubt. Yeah. So adaptation is not prediction. Adaptation is not about foresight. Um, and adaptation itself is really about paying attention to the emerging, right? So if you look at the next slide over here. Yeah. Is what I like to start to draw your attention to. Paying attention to what is emerging within a crisis is a really critical skill set in which um, I, I, I don't know whether you, you can apologize for the language, but just to calm the shit down and start to open your eyes and really look at what, what's happening in terms of trends or changes. What this slide explains over here is that um, systems will always change. Okay, So the way that human beings meet their needs or build you know, um, some, some certainty around their needs is to build systems. So a healthcare system, an education system, uh, even a financial system, these are all systems right, to help us begin to meet our needs. And essentially, that's what the job market is. It's a whole collection of different systems and seeing which system succeeds, which system fails. Right? But the systems are only there because human beings have needs. Right? So the fact of the matter itself is, as far as 7 billion people across a world, world are concerned, we did not suddenly pass COVID not have needs. Right? The only thing itself that has really happened is our needs have changed. Right? And therefore, the systems also have begun to change, right? So systems will change, right? But they evolve, they don't stop. So the idea itself that, oh, you know, the job market is shrinking. You're not looking at a situation where the job market is shrinking, but looking at a situation where the job market is evolving or changing. 
Um, and that's only evolving because human needs are evolving. So it's interesting over here because if you start paying attention even to how your spending patterns have changed, or you notice over here how your parents' spending patterns have changed, what habits they've changed, what do they no longer need, what do they start to need, okay? And these particular things, that observation, will really start giving you an indication of, hmm, if this is true for my mom, is it true for all the moms in Singapore? And if it is, is that basically a new need that I have to begin to pay attention to? So it's fascinating, at least in my particular scope of work over here, um, there was never really, a, there was an awareness that mental health was the issue, but this day and age over here, it's as if mental health issues are really starting to get more and more prominence, largely as a result of people being at home, more in the domestic abuse, all sorts of emotional issues are going on. So I have seen over here, at least in my own experience, a surge in terms of number of clients who have been asking for conversations and interventions. And ironically itself, right, because, you know, uh, online communication is so much easier, uh, my work has begun to scale, right? And that's really itself as a result of how needs are changing. We know the office spaces are changing. We know itself that transport is changing. Yeah, but how this will finally settle, no one knows. And that's why we can't predict it. Right, next slide. I also want you to be very aware that uh, needs, as far as human beings are concerned, they are highly contextual. So pay attention to the context of why a person is changing their needs. Um, when a woman, a young woman, a 50-year-old woman, a young man, racial groups, you know, um, class structures, all these particular things, right? these demographics or these contexts or the country or the history, they all begin to impact right? how these markets are going to shift and change. So my work is really just about studying that all the time. It's almost anthropological right? Uh, in nature. And what we're seeing over here is that new needs are indeed emerging. So uh, I'm of the space over here where I'm paying attention, observing these new trends that I see. So this is how we can pivot, right? And this is how we can move. So a lot of the times over here, especially when you're applying for jobs, I advise you to move away from a panic of prediction and control. Uh, it won't take you into any place really strong. Um, I think many people claim to have an answer right now. Uh, I, I'm not so sure, sure the answers are very clear. Yeah. So listen, uh, practice empathy uh, for context. For how long do you think these changes will happen? Um, yeah, and you adapt to that. And that's what really adaptation is. It is a paying attention to the emergent. Right. Okay, next question. So the next question being asked over here is that in a time like this, how can you stand out or how can I stand out? So if I go to a lot more of these online job interviews and things like that, then how do I come to a space where someone will, send, will start to notice, right? So uh, let's look at my first response. I've got three for you. Okay, so the second question is sort of leading in from the first. And we are saying over here that multiple different systems are in disruption. Uh, they are changing and uh, we need to begin to pay attention itself right, to how they begin to change, right? Okay, but what are these systems that we're looking at and how do we sort of categorize them? So the first thing I'd like you to do over here is to understand that the nature of work or all work actually is driven by essentially four big systems, right? After that, it, it cascades down to pyramids of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of systems. But um, largely, it's not right. There are four main systems. The first system is the material system. So try to imagine this as um, very early agricultural societies or mining societies, or anybody itself, right? That's basically getting commodity from the ground, getting commodity from nature, right? Pulling out resources, right? Uh, and or manipulating elements to begin to create, you know, plastics and so on and so forth. Okay. So that whole human system that is actually uh, mining, growing, you know, harvesting, so on and so forth, that's the entire what we call the material system. So that system is being built essentially in order to make sure that material is um, uh, grown, harvested, transformed, and put on your table. Okay? So that's called the material system. The human system is where, if you look at typical economics between a product and a service, whereas the material system handles basically the product, the human system handles the services. So education, uh, if you look at even the military, if you look at uh, ideas of um, you know, training, development, uh, HR, in one other case, all these over here are trying to actually take out the best, uh, the other resource, which is human resource, and getting the best out of this particular system, right? 
So whereas there is the material system we're taking out commodities and such, there's also basically an enhancement of the human system, right? So I'm in that particular work over here to take a look at how do we grow that particular human system. So uh, everything you're looking at in terms of human development sits in this particular system, okay? The third is when you have a product system and a service system and they're dealing with basically commodities and humans, then somebody needs to make the call over, you know, uh, what goes where and why do we do this versus doing this? So someone must make decisions, right? This is called the political system, which means everything that involves uh, anything from politics to elections to uh, CEOs to hierarchies to, um, you know, everything that we talk about in terms of power or gaining some sort of power. So the political system is another huge system where there's another system trying to teach people how do you gain influence, power, you know, uh, get to make the call, put your, you know, self on the table, making sure that you have your seat at the table. And that's another kind of industry or work over here that evolves. And a lot of people are sitting in that, okay? So the more you move up basically the value cycle, right, the less people will be involved in that particular work, right? Obviously, the most people, 7 billion people across the world are in the material system, then the human system, and then the political system, right? The last system over here is a system that runs through the entire thing, okay? And that particular system over here is essentially the financial system, the system that's driving the currency or the monetization of all these three main processes here. And if I'm not wrong, uh, most of our jobs over here will sit somewhere between these four main systems. Now, uh, short of going into a very deep lecture, each of these systems are being disrupted uniquely, okay? And we said that we've never had a time where we are having a health crisis, a, a job crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis, a social crisis, and arguably this is a long drawn one, an ecological crisis, all at the same time, right? And as we're going through these particular situations over here, it's these systems that are being disrupted. So that's the first thing we must understand in principles, okay? So when we are applying for a job and we're going into a job market, right, largely we must understand we're actually, you must be clear what is the system you're applying to. Okay, next slide. So I hope I don't come across too strong or too harsh about this. The challenge I've had over the past maybe three weeks or so is that I've had multiple different, I mean, I, I work a lot with young people and a lot of young people coming to me and they're coming in a panic and they're saying, please help me, uh, I can't get a job. And it's interesting over here because in a time of shared pain, which is what this period is, and a time of shared uncertainty, which is what this time is, um, Self-absorption doesn't help well, no matter how much pain you're in. Because largely, unlike most situations over here, employers actually are in equal amount of uncertainty and pain. Um, and what they're looking for itself is people who are willing to be on their team, right? And a lot of that starts with some empathy over, if I'm in this particular system, whether material, you know, um, political system, whatever the case over there, uh, what is the pain point in which I'm experiencing right now? Right? So... It's about showing understanding, right? That when a gap, when a job is available, it means a gap has to be filled. And there's something within my system right now where I'm trying to save it, revive it, you know, grow it, or whatever the case over there, where I need solutions for that. So being able to uh, fundamentally understand what each system and the pain points are going through, right? It's actually really critical to show your empathy in, in, in that work. Um, so it's not for lack of willing to take that time to begin to teach what each system is, is uniquely co concerned about. But I think it doesn't take a genius to think through that, right? What it really is the challenge of supply chains today. What really is the challenge of, of human development today? What really is the challenge of earning people trust and having influence and power over them? Right? What really is the issue today? What really is the issue itself right, with money right, today? And if you think about this, you will then understand these are big issues, right, that almost like are, <laughs> are plaguing the world right now. And every company organization, right, whether big or small, is out there somewhere itself, right, to try and fit in this particular value chain. So it is about showing your understanding of that particular gap that need filled, right, uh, and understanding what is the nature of their business. Right. Next slide, please. And I last off, I end that. This, this this slide that we're saying this that ignore their pain at your own peril. Um, if you go to an interview over here and your pain becomes or your nervousness or your 
anxiety and concern really is actually larger than death. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think you're building up the trust that's necessary to get yourself on the team. Yeah, um, especially during crisis, we need people that are more and more team focused. Um, so spending that time or that duration, and I think just now even there was some advice over preparing for the interview, but what fundamentally are you preparing for, right? And what are you really learning about? And I would say yourself that you're learning about the industry, you're learning about the pain points, and all leaders over here, they want good people on their team. So job vacancies really begin with uh, their need, uh, and sadly, not, not yours. Um, but your question over here is really an alignment of, in terms of your particular work that you need to do, or the needs in which you fulfill for yourself and for your family, um, how does that align together with you know, this company's needs? And that alignment right, um, is your responsibility to communicate. This is how we align. Yeah. Um, so don't expect employers to really you know, make that particular link for you because the joy of actually having, I've had some really good interviews over the past two weeks where someone comes in and immediately understands basically where the alignment is. Um, and that's been very powerful. It's like, wow, okay, you're, you're in, dude. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So it's quite funny because when I first read this question, right, my first response was Abu Din. So, so it's like, is it dangerous to job seekers stay and apply for too long? Well, let's let's pause, right? This is why I meant the caveat over here. I I am very conscious about basically that we come from a society where there's multiple different income inequalities, right? And the danger itself is obviously a financial one for some families. Uh, and I I don't want to use this time to really belabor that point. I get it. And it's reality. Um, but I want to extend between what I think is, uh, and uh, what this question is, is alluding to. Okay, so let's uh, change the next slide first. So the fear of unemployment, right? And the big concern over here is, I get it that it's about the lack of income. Right. And that's a very real threat. Um, but I think what the question is al alluding to is a question of whether or not if I really don't stay in activity or I don't contribute or I don't move for long, will that be dangerous? Right. And the short answer is yes. Um, human beings are nothing but habits. Right. Our integrity, our character, our values, our cognitive mindsets, our emotions, our speech patterns, all of these things are habits, right? And in these particular habits over here, when we sit unemployed essentially for uh, a year, the question is not whether or not you are drawing income. The question is whether or not you are contributing. I say it again. If you basically are in a season of unemployment for a year, okay, the question is not whether or not you draw income. Okay, The bigger question is whether or not you're contributing. So, come to the next slide. And what it's saying over here is that even if you are not being paid, staying in a space of contribution, right? I don't mean to be lame about this, okay? Whether you are volunteering, giving, you know, testing, trying, whatever the case over there, the contribution is what grows the person, not the income or the employment, okay? When we contribute as people, this is a source of who we are. This is our identity, our dignity. This is a source of confidence of, you know, whether or not I'm a person of value. This is a source of actually, because of routine practice, skill, right, and mastery. It's also the source itself, right, basically value and how people still touch with you. So when a person itself, right, who may not be drawing income, it just means they're unemployed, but it doesn't mean they're not in contribution. So the question to ask over here is that, is it dangerous that job seekers stay unemployed for too long? The real answer actually is not too dangerous as long as you stay in contribution. Because staying in contribution and allowing people to experience you, right, as a person of, who creates value, okay, it will give you a job sooner or later. And in this crisis over here, I can tell you uh, there is oh, so much opportunity for value to be created for people, right, as long as we stay empathetic to the needs in which they are going through, which is a lot of what I said earlier. It's about listening, right? So just change the slide, please.
So having a network, okay, having good health, having an innovative and creative mind, you know, always scheming and being entrepreneurial and trying new things, these are independent of employment. And it's strange over here because I'm seeing a lot of patterns right now where people are saying, only when I'm employed, then do I get to really test, you know, if I can't do anything real. Uh, and again, I'm saying this over here, I'm conscious of the fact we come from a lot of diversity, but generally, I've seen people that even from the poorest backgrounds, they stay entrepreneurial. They stay healthy. They stay keeping their friendships there, even though they're unemployed. And it's, it's not coincidental it's not soon after that you know soon after that that they will get a job yeah so we're saying over here that these things are independent right of our employment here can i just change the slide please oops no can you just go back possible no one more sorry it's the last slide <laughs> forward forward two i think yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I mean over here. They are they are independent of of employment. Yeah. So I'm more concerned that you continue to work on these particular things, work on building up your network, building up your health. Uh please try not to sink into depression, anxiety, things like that. Um, and I know that for some of us over here, we no longer have a choice because we're already in these particular patterns. Um yeah, but I have seen people who are struggling with mental health issues because of all this situation. And they are doing their most courageous best at staying healthy. They're learning where the boundaries, they're learning where the triggers are, they're learning how to do basically their, their clarity of mindset. And they have been, I mean, to me, right, people who have really earned my respect. Yeah, I'm saying if you can put in your best to actually stay in health, uh, to stay innovative, um, even though you're unemployed, that's really admirable. Yeah. Okay, last question. So my very very first response, and I, I don't know whether the person who asked this question is actually within the audience now. Um, and I hope I don't come across as too facetious uh, when, when, I, when I respond. But if I were to paraphrase the question, um, it can sound something like this. It can be sound like, if I am 0 0.8 meters and I am 6 years old, does that mean I'll be 1.4 meters when I'm 11? And the answer is, no one knows. <laughs> there is no freaking way there's a correlation between your starting pay and how much you will earn when you're starting your career. It's too long a journey for that correlation to be made. Right? And we know this, right? I'm a three-time repeat student. Right? I repeated my O levels, A levels, university. By the time itself, right, I criminal record, right? I started all this like crap over here. By the time I got out of the system and finally graduated. I was, I was really like 27, right? And because I went to drive, you know, car illegally and I don't really have a license, you know, and I got arrested and all this shit over there, right? I couldn't actually get a proper job, even though I wanted to be a teacher. So I was a relief teacher for three whole years, right? So I got paid $1,600 a month, right, for three years. Right? So now the question itself is really whether that stage of what I went through in life means that, you know, I'm screwed for the rest of it. And it was my teachers and mentors that shook it out of me and helped me understand that it really is no correlation. There is a fear and the pattern of actually that I have a bad start means I have a bad finish. Um, but it's my teachers that really grounded me in this. Yeah. Bad starts have nothing to do with how you finish. So if Clara can just change the slide for me. And I encourage you to say this over here, that there are essentially five main pillars to your career development. Okay. Um, money and salary is not one of them. And I recognize over here that, uh, again, I want to show sensitivity to the fact that for some of us, right, money is a very important part because of actually the, the state of the family or the state of actually who is depending on you. I get that. Um, but I want to say itself that even as you're growing in terms of your career, you need to understand that there, there are a few fundamental layers that, that, that keep going. So the first layer and why people hire you is essentially because of your skills, Right. And that's what maybe your education will take you to. So you have a certain level of skills at there. So, but the skills are largely a vertical. The skills are not horizontal. So quite basically, you have a skill 
then the more you begin to move up the work cycle, the more you will need to apply that skill across multiple different groups or different situations. So that's what we call building range or building some sort of breadth, right? So one is a depth in skill, one is a breadth in application, right? Or a breadth in terms of the different kinds of skills that you have. Right? Now, that's even better. But in doing so over here, what happens is that skills and range are largely within your 20s all the way to your early 30s. But somewhere itself, right, in your early 30s and beyond, you start asking the question on purpose and you will actually get a tangible answer. Um, asking questions about passion, purpose, right, too early actually is really quite difficult because we don't know what we're willing to suffer for. And that's what essentially passion and purpose is. It is when you have found a cause that you're willing to suffer for, you're willing to stay up nights for, you're willing to, you know, to, to strive for, you're willing to really burn your ass for, right? And in doing so over here, knowing that answer to what I'm passionate about in your early 20s, um, yeah, I, I've seen so far, in terms, there are only a few who really have that privilege of really finding it. Uh, and if you do, that's, that's your blessing. Yeah, but the many of us who don't, um, I don't find us, I found mine largely in my late 30s or so, right, in terms of purpose. So when purpose is combined itself right, with skill and range, then the career evolves again, right? And it evolves into uh, people starting to pay attention like, wow, oh, this person itself, right, not only has narrative and identity in what they're doing, but they actually have skill by which to deliver it. And that's when influence starts to go. So this whole change the world stuff over here, whether or not we actually can influence change, right, and shift things, again, a lot of the change the world stuff aims to come to a place where we're trying to build it young. So a Greta Thunberg can come in and exercise a great amount of influence. But then the next question that people will ask is, but does she have the competence and the skills by which to deliver all these particular things? And sure, it's a great ex exertion itself of that influence. Um, but what's the substance behind it, right? And how does this really grow? So um, a lot of people right now actually are prematurely building some, right? They have they have insistence that, oh, I won't start my career until I find my purpose. Or I... Uh, will start my career itself until basically I was, I, you know, I wish I could change the world. I wish I could influence people right now. Um, and these things, they do take time, but they, they will come. Yeah. So please hear me. Uh, this is not chronological, but skills, range, purpose, they tend to grow upon one another. And only when influence is there, um, then change genuinely starts to happen. And you have power to start to change some pretty large systems right, as, as you go along. So can I just change that, please? So typically when a starting pay is low, um, a starting pay is an indicator of your skills, okay? Even if you had influence, even if you had purpose, actually many of these things are actually unmeasurable. And that's why it's very hard to work it into a salary matrix. So I have met people who are deeply passionate about things, highly influential, skill sets, are, uh, they can grow after a while um, and they start off with a low salary. But it has no... The, there's no indicator of the fact that basically that they're not of value to me. I found over here that when I grow their skill sets to a level where they're actually able to contribute, then suddenly their influence and their you know charisma and their purpose it multiplies. Yeah. And you'll see basically the salaries grow quite quite rapidly. So you can see salary, you know, paths grow all all, all different ways. Like. Um, but I'll say over here, yes, there's really no correlation between a low starting pay and how you'll do it long run. So should you just accept it? My question is, do you feel you can contribute? Right? Do you feel you can contribute? And if you have found a team that you really can contribute to and a work or a system in which you feel that, you know, I really want to do this kind of work, then yeah, that's it. And accept that. Yeah. Uh, can I can just check with that one more slide after that? Yeah. So being intentional, right, about growing up this particular range of skills is really quite critical. Um, and that intentionality in being very clear about what I'm trying to build at each point in time is something which necessarily, uh, I, I send, I've noticed that it has to correlate with uh, good salaries in, in, in the long term. A lot of the people which I meet right now, other than the financial sector, that's another, you know, just shut my mouth and not say too much. But people yourself right, who are creating a lot of value in the world, people I respect, people, you know, I find that, wow, you're amazing at contribution. They, they tend to get paid quite, quite, quite well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, there are people who manage other people's money. Yeah, that's a different thing. Okay. I think I am done. I'm done, Tara. I'm back. Wait, let me just add the rest in as well. 
to be honest, right? I'm still trying to digest whatever <laughs> that you just shared. It's really? very, very yeah. It, especially question three. Question three really, really got me. But before that, let me just ask you something about um question one. So you know yeah. um you you know we've heard a lot about this term. Oh, we need to adapt to the new norms. Uh, you know we need to pivot. But what exactly? Are the new norms that we are talking about? I think it's something that is not so nicely defined. I'm wondering if you can weigh in on that. I don't think anyone knows yet. Um, the new norm, okay. the The very big new norm that's definitely happening is um, this whole work from home thing is really quite something. I think we people landlords are really quite worried right now, uh, and they're worried about basically this whole new notion of basically how roads are going to change and how a Office space is gonna change. Yeah. So I'm already starting to reconfigure all this stuff already. Um, I think people are starting to gain a joy in staying home that they've never experienced before. Right. And a lot of the resistance we had to technological or telecommuting, uh is some of people have gotten over it in a major way. Yeah. Uh, mm. we've gotten over all the resistance to say, okay, no, I cannot. Uh. And I found people are starting to get really creative with how they use Zoom. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's look at this right now. It's so weird. So, so anyhow, <laughs> for God's sake. So, so, so you're seeing this over here. I know our behaviors are changing, right? Um, yeah, so sorry. I, 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 I'm not in the place over here to comment over how these okay. things are. But there is going to be a new normal, okay? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, Tokong and Jared, do you have anything? If not, I have something to ask again. <laughs> No, go ahead, Clara. Okay. Jardine, anything? No, it's okay. You, Clara, I think you have a, a question to ask to me. You can just go ahead. Okay. Uh, your part, right, where you say that an interview is not about you. It's about showing an understanding of the gap that needs to be filled. I think, yeah. you know, in leading up towards uh, get like, you know, preparing, even when you're in schools and whatnot, you know, all that, that we've done is really just to show that we have achievements to show. And, you know, the fact that you're saying that, oh, okay, uh, you know, it's not about, like, flaunting your achievements sounds a bit contradictory, I think, for job seekers because that's really, I guess, in, in their own point of view, their chance to shine, let's say, to even stand out from other competitors. Mm -hmm. So, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't know whether, like, how, how can we actually figure out what is the fine line between bragging or just being proud of your achievements? Whenever I ask you, okay, if you were to go on a first date with somebody, huh? <laughs> if you were to yeah. go on a first date with somebody, would you prefer that this first date like, spends the whole day talking about themselves and how amazing they are? Or would you prefer yourself like, to listen to you and she get a sense of actually what your needs are and what you really want? Okay. The second one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing over here. This, I, uh. <laughs> I think maybe if it comes down to a competitive environment where basically, you know, I really have no real needs at the top MNC, I come to a space over here where I'm, I'm really quite secure whether you're in or out, right? I'm looking for management consultants, then yes, I'm looking for the most amazing person that will show off basically the bangles and, you know, say who actually is wobbling. Sure. Yeah, but that's because I don't cover from a place of need. The trouble with this job crisis over here is that there's need everywhere. So if we're self-absorbed and we go in and we start showing our bling, mm. I, yeah, that you could actually incur some contempt. Okay. I'd like to weigh in on Tony's uh, point, if you don't mind. Is it okay if I speak clearer? Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I, I, do, I do agree very much with what he's saying. So I feel that in the interview, uh, just as it's important to, you know, to talk, it's also very important to listen. After all, interview is a conversation, right? It's not like a Q&A session uh, with you. So perhaps maybe instead of just like, you know, stating all your achievements outright, right? Perhaps it's also good to kind of like ask questions and listen. So for instance, like where is this you know company heading? You know, what why are you missing in your team? What challenges um, does your organization face along the way? And then think mm. about what you have in your skill sets and also experience that could plug this gap. So let's say for example, you are a fluent uh, Bahasa speaker, right? And the company does mention that they want to expand to either Indonesia or Malaysia. Then if you happen to have the relevant skill, then this is your time to take it out and um show off uh, about it 
in, in a way that is of course um humble as well yeah so i guess like what we mentioned nobody wants to be you know bombarded with um you know a list of like your achievements on the first uh, meeting itself whether it is on an interview basis or a first date basis um, I guess a lot of women can actually relate to the example of like going out with a guy and like, oh, this is my Rolex, you know, <laughs> the subtle humble brag uh, kind of kind of like situation. Uh. So if you don't like that experience on a date, then what makes you think that uh uh you know the employer would like this kind of experience or so on yeah, first mm-hmm. interview? Yeah. I will never forget this episode right now <laughs> of that question you just posted to me. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. Okay, wait. Give me a moment. Okay. Uh, another question I have, Tongyi. Uh, yeah, the, the third question you had, right? Contribution is the value you get. So um, it's not about the money or the income that you draw. Um, again, right? Sounds sounds very nice, but then again, for 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 those who let's say look, are looking for jobs, just not not just for let's say experience, but more of uh, survival or like um, you know really just do not waste any time in their own perspective. How do they actually sell themselves to future employees if let's say they did one year of volunteering work? No, I didn't say that you can go one year of volunteering work. Um, example. Yeah, the the volunteering work again. It, it it goes back to the earlier question. I think of question two. So that there are essentially four yeah. main systems in which we can work in, right? The volunteering work is a lot of work to do with basically the human system, the political system. Yeah. Uh. So short of me going to like very deep into this shit, right? Every system has its initial pain points and things like that. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying not to go too deep and then blow everyone. Um, okay. Yeah. Stay in contribution to the system that you are going to con- contribute to. That's where you build your skill sets. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Uh, I'll I'll look at our Q and A now. So okay. let me just. <clears throat> okay. You know. <clears throat> okay, this is one question that I saw um, one of our community members actually asked. So this person is 33 years old, so around their mid-career, um, in, in, into their career, uh, looking for a change, have been in the industry for eight years, clueless as to what this person wants next because he or she doesn't know themselves. Um, okay with the current modest pay, so money isn't something that is really pushing her for a career change um but she's 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 a bit confused because um she knows that staying in her current department also means that her pay will probably be stagnant or about there not much of a change uh so she she feels like she wants she she's hoping for some guidance because it's starting to feel like that she mentioned she's just working for uh, for just a salary and regretted not seeking out a career path that she wants so she's hoping like for a reality check right now um Dokeng, any any uh any input on this one yeah i think uh the the framework that that tong yi shared just now is uh, very applicable um but that I, I think that's kind of meta as well um but if we we talk about uh, specifics and let's say very tactical stuff. Um, I think one good framework when when thinking about whether to do a job uh, job switch is to firstly learn about the industry. So read up about the industry, see whether there's interest, and then if there is interest, uh, you can then go and pick up new skills uh, to make sure that you are a good candidate for that particular job. Um, so that's kind of how I would see it. And there are actually various uh, government schemes and initiatives that actually help uh, people who want to transit into a new industry. So WSG and E2Y, they have uh, initiatives like uh, the Career Transition Program. They have the PMAX program. Uh, The details of of these uh, programs are on the E2Y website. And I I would urge uh, this uh, particular person to maybe check it out and see whether it it fits uh, his or her interests and profile. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Geraldine Tongi, any thoughts on this question? No, no, no. I just find that this person's quite interesting. <laughs> um, maybe I'd like to. Hi, hello. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like to 
to to weigh in on um, this question as well. So basically, what the the person is actually asking is that you know, um, where can she go next, right? Um, so she's looking outward. Um, but perhaps maybe before looking outward, um, she could also look inward first to just identify, like you know, first of all, like what exactly you know is she unhappy about in her present circumstances, and also try to understand herself first, like you know, what her own strengths, what her own weaknesses, and. You know, I think this is also a question that, you know, many of the fresh graduates face, not just, you know, mid-career switches. Like, for example, when I graduated myself, I didn't have a very uh, clear and concrete idea of exactly what I wanted to do as well. So, it's, um, rather than just, you know, of course, exploring helps, you know, learning about other career helps, doing internship helps. But I guess it's ultimately um, figuring out what you want to do, like thinking about, like, you know, what are the things that you can tolerate and you cannot tolerate and all that. And then trying to find something that is aligned with that. So maybe my advice to this um, person, I think so. Is it a lady or a gentleman? Yeah, they didn't say the gender. Oh, can't tell. Yeah, yeah, anonymous. Yeah. yeah, this person here. Um, you know what you can do is actually just uh, do two things. Uh, first of all, of course, focus on like you know discovery of careers and stuff like that. But don't neglect yeah. your self discovery as well. Okay, let's look at another question. Uh, for a fresh grad, okay, this one. How much time should we give ourselves to look for a job? I'm worried that I will be unemployed for too long. <laughs> this. <laughs> uh, do you hear what Tongi said just now? Yeah. <laughs> so just keep in mind. Uh, yeah, it's about contribution, not about the pay. <laughs> uh, but uh, Tokeng, Jardine, anything on this? Mm, I, I think it really depends on, on your individual circumstance. So, so you know, starting with uh, introspection and all that is, is definitely the way to go. And once you feel like you are ready or, or you, you, your external circumstance requires you to find a job, then, it's to, then it would be to shift gears and to be more action-oriented. And, and once you're in the action-oriented mode, it's just go, go, go and apply for as many jobs as, as possible. So, you know, first think uh, think and introspect, and then once you feel like you're ready and, and you wanna you wanna apply for a job, then it's uh, full steam ahead. Mm, and I think that the key to, you know, even if you're unemployed, right, the key is to not stay, um, to not, not to not stay stagnant, to not do anything. Like you can, like I guess what our guest shared earlier as well, you know, even if you're unemployed, then find something that is still, is still worth your time during this period. Yeah, so, you know, volunteering or, like, uh, taking up new courses, things like that. Okay, another question. Um, this person has a career path to plan out initially, but plans were disrupted after COVID-19 hit. Uh, feels like a major advantage compared to previous batches when graduated earlier. Any advice? Actually, just in quick response to the previous question, right, I do feel that taking up a job uh, for yeah. the sake of it, um, I think it is a tactical strategic choice to really just choose a job largely based upon the fact that this job will give me a skill. Uh, and, mm. and to underestimate. So remember we talked about uh, depth and breadth. So people who have got this one track, right? This is the track that's going to make me successful. They're trying to play the depth route. But sometimes yeah. not a lot of motivation comes in that breadth. In just taking up stuff that, you know, I'm, that, that I'm not expecting. Um, uh, so I definitely have stumbled upon that, that which is what, what brings me to actually the next question. So if you can go back to that, to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one, right? I find fascinating because there was a recent uh, talk right, that I was giving over here where the metaphor emerged that Singaporeans are very much like, um, we have multiple train tracks in front of us and we move from one train track to another and we call that adaptation, right? And sometimes if there's enough of a train track, therefore we can be flexible. But actually we're still following the freaking train track, right? Um, so the difference over here is that before the train track was even built, there was the forest. And the forest, some of the forage and begin to actually open up to even build those train tracks. The season that we're in right now, as far as the economy is concerned, is that these train tracks, I think many of them are in disrepair. I mean, no longer work very well. And we're starting to move into a foraging space. But we're entering the spaces where we're uncertain of what is it we're building, but we go back day by day. So a lot of the things over here is I'm asking whether this person is willing to be to forage. Yeah, and I think if they're still stuck upon the mindset where they're looking for some sort of set train track, right? I, I don't think they're gonna find it. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are there a disadvantage? No lah. You just learn how to forage now lor. <laughs> Nicely summed up. Okay, another question. When deciding a career path, is the passion or pragmatism more important than your choice? So I think this question, right, is is um it's not it's not an uncommon one. Um, I I I do think that maybe I can use myself as an example. So. Before my my current job here right now at Sydney, uh, I was in an industry in a job that I really really liked, and it was it was almost like everything like well right after graduation I I got this dream job there and I'm fine and I, like right away you know the first one but after which um after like the one year markish plus I just started to realize that hey I I'm here I like what I'm doing but I feel like there's no there's no more learning for me it has kept and. Then I feel like okay. Then that, that that's a clear sign for me to it's time to go. Um, but I it, it took me a while to really um, make this move because I was thinking, hey, I'm really in something that, like you know, that the whole the whole term of let's say uh your dream job, you know, already there you have it, it's in your hands. Uh, but then you're stepping into something else just to sort of learn and grow. But I I I I personally have not regretted my path. But I I understand the struggle this person has in terms of um passion versus pragmatism. So to my guests, right? Uh, what advice do you have for someone like that? Mm, maybe I will weigh in first. Um, oh, the, am I unmuted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah I can. Okay, great. So perhaps maybe um, you know, I don't think there's a, a right or wrong path. You can work for passion, and you can also work for you know out of um practical needs, right? But perhaps maybe it's worth also to understand uh yourself first. Like, what do you see a job as? You know, as an individual, is it something that should bring you a lot of joy, or is it something that you know is just meant to finance the rest of your life? Like, for example, the family you want, the hobbies that you have, and things like that. Um, another misconception that many people have is that passion is a prerequisite for job satisfaction, which is not exactly, um, I would say, hundred percent correct. Uh, because there's a lot of other things that can make one satisfied in a job. For instance, that kind of sense of achievement, having very nice colleagues, um, having a very good boss who teaches you and mentor you, and all that, or maybe just simply having very good work-life balance. So there's so many things that can make you happy in your job, um, and perhaps maybe passion is just one of the many many things. Furthermore, even if you look out of uh, pragmatism, it doesn't mean that you can't pursue your passion in other areas of your life. So, for instance, for myself, um, I I like my job, I like the field that I'm in, but I. I wouldn't say it's like you know, wow, um, number one passion in life and all that, right? So for myself, I like to to do volunteer work and all that. So I actually pursue my passion outside of the work instead. Yeah, mm-hmm. so clarify. Um, there's really no right or wrong answer. Hmm. Okay. Tuokeng and Tongi, anything on this? My quick response is that I think it's a it's a false dichotomy. Yeah, it's only one that becomes apparent when you're younger and you have less options. So when you're forced to choose between A or B, that's because you only have options A and B. But typically, yourself, when you get older and older, you have the ability to craft and shape your own jobs. Um, and doing so over here, you are able to shape circumstances over here, which allow to meet both. So my advice over here is actually it doesn't matter what you start off with, either passion or pragmatism, because eventually you will go to points of influence where you can grow that innovation between the both um but it takes some time to, to build there so be patient yeah i promise you there's a center middle mm. Mm, maybe just yeah maybe just a quick comment yeah it's it's reassuring to to hear that from tony because honestly i think i struggle with this myself uh not not at the 30 plus age range yet so uh still discovering that that, that passion and and yeah not there yet but i think uh the key point is uh, it's an iterative process and it's a learning journey and we will we will eventually get there lot. So I think I yeah. will concur with uh, Tongyi. Okay, the next question. Uh, maybe just not for a fresh grad, uh, but open it up for all job seekers who are probably asking this question. Uh, how do you negotiate for a higher salary or pay the smart way? <laughs> I always think just work for yourself. Okay, never mind. I'll just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeremy, not talking then. 
All right. So maybe I'll share um, what has perhaps maybe um, worked for me. First of all, I feel that in maybe I wouldn't answer this in the in the perspective of a fresh grad, but someone who has maybe had one job already. Um, I feel it's quite important to have friends in your industry. Eh? So you can kind of like exchange information, right? Like, oh, you work at here. Oh, okay, okay. What is the range uh, that, and all that? Or maybe you get an offer. You can also ask people like, um, oh, okay. Um, like sometimes I get an offer, I'll just send to my friends uh, who are in the same industry. It's just uh, like two or three people like that. And then ask them like, oh, okay, what do you think? Am I being low-bored and stuff like that to validate um, this information as well? Because information is power. Right? The more <laughs> information you have, then easier to... Um, negotiate also. So I think that's one. Um, if you don't have friends in the industry, I do encourage you to look at other benchmarks that are available online. For instance, I love Glassdoor. I think it's like really accurate and, and good also, not just in terms of salary, but also company reviews, CEO reviews, and um, you know, just giving you an insider view into how the company is um, doing and progressing and all that. So that's another resource that I use um, as well. So I guess, yeah, this would be my key tips for, you know, any uh, one who is looking to actually get a better offer out there. Hmm. If, if I could just weigh in here on, on the question, which is a uh, scope on fresh grads, I think uh, fresh grads uh, unfortunately have very little leverage in, in negotiating a, a salary uh, because a lot of, let's say, the structured management associate programs, they have a fixed pay. So if, if it's, it's a, either you take it or you leave it. Um, there, for example, there's also the SG United traineeship, right? So the pay range there is 1,008 to 2,005. There's no way you can get anything above 2,005. So for fresh grads, uh, you know, it's your first job, focus on learning skills acquisition. And then when, when you go to your next job, uh, all the tips that Geraldine, uh, that has, uh, Geraldine shared just now would apply. So um, I would maybe de-emphasize a little bit on, on the pay for, for your first job. And, and you can always compare uh, with the various job offers. And with, if you want to optimize for pay, you can always choose the job offer with the higher pay. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. I found a simple way of balancing it is to start, let's say, with a job of 2008. And then if you want to get your 3006, then look for your passion job that will pay you 700. Then just work at nights. So it's... But that's the balance, lah, right? Yep. Yeah. Not, I thought you say start your own business. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, uh, let's, <laughs> okay, let's look at the live questions that are coming in. So uh, I saw, okay, so you know, so far we've talked about how, uh, like the question that we had just now, right? Passion versus pragmatism. So for someone who doesn't have, um, doesn't have a clue as to what, um, they want and they like, know what they want as a career. So there are some people who are you know, really blessed with knowing exactly what they want after graduation, what they want to do, have their career plan set out for them. Um, some not really. Uh, so if you do not know, let's say, what you like and what you don't like and you're stuck in a job that you never really liked, uh, how do you actually get over something like that? Or how do you actually figure out or try to figure out something that you actually like? <laughs> I don't know whether this is going to trigger people. It's okay. We can agree to disagree. Okay. <laughs> I think in all the coaching I've had, it's not that people cannot find a job they like. It's that people struggle with the, the courage to go into it. It's not that jobs that you like don't exist. They, they do. Mm. I'm just not willing to pay the price for that job. So I think people should take responsibility uh, over not being able to find jobs that they like. If they really in circumstances which don't allow them to begin to move into jobs they like, then it's also about accepting the circumstance because you're also choosing to be responsible and taking care of what responsibilities you have. And that's an admirable thing. So every mother on earth understands that. You think they like cleaning your shit? No. <laughs> you think they like, you know, this? No. But parenting itself, they, they do things because it, it's born out of character. It's not born out of whether I like or do not like. So there are some people who genuinely will do jobs because it's born out of character. And I think mm -hmm. maybe they must be careful over the fact that we always have choice. Yeah. Sometimes the choice is being responsible. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, my two other guests, anything before I move to the next question? Okay, let's go. Uh, I have another question that just came through uh, that I found. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this person uh, got a job, started two months ago, but realized that uh, they don't, he or she doesn't like it there, um, you know, uh, away with all the office politics, whatnot. Uh, current experience, uh, you know, if she's only two months in, I think her, or he, his, his or her question is, do I actually state that, oh, I'm actually at a job that's, that lasted for only two months and I left. Like I think he or she is worried as to how um the employer might think about why why do you leave a job so soon. So uh maybe this one right I I, I direct it to Tuokeng especially because you you might have experience with uh handling candidates like that. So uh, two months, um, it's it's not it's not very long but it's not irrelevant as well. Uh, would you suggest for example to put it in instead of not putting it in? Mm, I, I think uh, the the general policy is that it, it's uh, full transparency is always better because in the reference check round maybe maybe they would find out anyway. So uh, if if we were to if if you if you wanted to put it you could, um, but you can be transparent about your experience as well. If you want to hide it because you don't want to bring it up. Um, I think that's also acceptable, but my personal preference is uh, for the formal. I, I don't think there's a strong bias uh, to either end, um, especially if you're a fresh grad, because I think implied in the question was that this is uh, perhaps the person's first job. And if it's the person's first job, then I think there's even less uh, reason to be, to be afraid. Lah. So there's no strong uh, recommendation to either side. Mm hmm Jeredy, anything on this? No. Tongi? Okay, never mind. I'll move to the next one. Um, another question that we have. Give me a moment. <clears throat> okay, so this person um, is not sure whether or not he or she can contribute to a company because the job role is something that is out of the comfort zone. So it's not it's not even like the interviewing phase where they they don't know they they know that um, it's something that they don't like or it's not something they are comfortable with. But if they're already in there, um, whether or not they don't they, they don't see themselves in any way being able to contribute to the company, then what should what should they do? Should they stay or should they leave? I think maybe a, a quick comment here is uh, you, you won't know until you try. And really the interview process, it's a process where you get to know the company better and the company will also get to know you better. So it's a two-way street and maybe the answer will come as you go through the interview. So I, I think that would be my answer. Tongi, what do you think? This is already in the job. Yeah, already in. Already in the job, right? Yeah. I generally it, I think yeah i generally think yeah I, I i do agree a bit with what token is saying that uh i'm of the principle that um what you resist will persist mm. yeah and that i i'm caught by the word uncomfortable um and i'm saying over here that i think a lot of our learning curve always exists in what is uncomfortable so i think the question is whether or not she's given herself a chance to really learn uh and she can reframe around this over here and basically find some value then after a year okay fine i've done my due diligence but you want to get over that resistance so you don't become too brittle uh uh, uh a staff yeah mm -hmm. it's okay. very difficult uh, complexity uh, when people are too brittle it, like cannot move here cannot move there should i yeah. yeah okay let's look at another question so um for this person john should i be leaving my work with hectic working conditions if they have a cash, he, he has a cash uh, buffer of more than five years to take a break in this current climate. I think the main concern that John has is um, whether or not he should do something like that during a time like this. Jerry, anything on uh, your thoughts on this one? I think you're muted. Hello. Yeah. So basically, um, maybe just to, to, to recap what she has um, asked, he or she has asked. Um, so she basically has a cash buffer of more than five years. And, you know, in this kind of climate, is it still good to take a career career break? Mm, no one can predict what will happen to this 
COVID-19 crisis. So, but if you look at the um, rehiring trends that were presented by, you know, Dokken just now, and I also checked LinkedIn uh, statistics and it has the same uh, situation with, you know, hiring rates increasing and all that. So it does seem to keep be getting more positive in the short term, but no one can predict what's going to happen in the in the long run. So if uh, assuming things get, get better, then of course, um, it would be good for her to kind of like, um, uh, you know, consider taking a break and all that. So I think maybe it'd be worth to for her to understand, right? Uh, what's the risk she's willing to to take? Uh, um, you know, and you know, let's say if this crisis um, goes on for five years, will she regret it um, and all? And also to also weigh that against her current circumstances in her present role. Maybe perhaps if there's something that is you know uh, really abusive or horrible about a company that is harming her mental health, you know, physical health and things yeah. like that, then I would say perhaps that is really a number one priority that she should, he or she should bear in mind. Yeah, compared to you know that kind of uncertainty because that is really um, I think something that you know a lot of people cannot uh, should not put up with. Yeah. Okay, uh, Tongyi and Tuokeng, anything? Okay, then I'll move on to the last question that we have for today. So this one, um, sh just share your thoughts. No right or wrong answer. So this, there's this article that came out a few months ago that one in four private school grads are unemployed, involuntarily working part-time six months after graduation. So a question also really came up um, by a member of ours. Do employers prefer local university graduates as compared to private university grads? And what can private uni grads do to increase their chances of, of employment? Now, I think the most straightforward answer right, would be things that um, you can do outside of your school. So for example, your experience working in internships, uh, your experience, for example, doing volunteering work, things that are not um, defined, things that don't define you based on the school that you come from, but it's kind of real life experiences that you do. Uh, my question to all three of my guests, uh, what do you think about a question like that? And if, if you can tell, give an advice to a private uni grad who is struggling to find a job, what would it be? There are two questions in this question. So the first one is, do employers prefer local university graduates compared to private university graduates? So for this part of the question, I guess the answer will be, it depends on the employers. There are some firms, uh, organizations, uh, which tend to have the practice whereby they actually pay uh, local uni grads more than you know private university graduates. And this is just bureaucracy and all. Or maybe they could even have this um, you know, system because the management are all from local uni, so they tend to favor local uni grads or so. So, so the, for the first part of the question, the answer would be it depends on who's the employer. Um, of course, there are also some jobs that actually value and prioritize um, academic, you know, achievement. So this kind of jobs, they would definitely prefer local uni grads as well. So for the second part of the question, it, it disappeared. No. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, so for the second part of the question is, uh, what can private university graduates do to increase their chances of employment? So I think you pointed out rightly, internships is um, one of them. There's also a lot of other yep. things. Um, so for example, you can try to get um, international exposure. Okay, I think that's very useful, especially Singapore is where companies base their regional HQ and use it as a launch pad to other markets. So international exposure would help a lot. Um, furthermore, Singapore's workforce is pretty much um, very international as well. So, you know, who knows, maybe you could have been gone on like an overseas internship in the same country as your hiring manager is from, and then that would create a lot of common ground and cultural topics to, to discuss or so. So international exposure helps as well. And I guess um, two more things that you can do. One is actually uh, investing or building a network, okay, um, which is what uh, one of my colleagues did to, to get into my current company. He actually went on LinkedIn to you know, talk to people, find out more about the industry and things like that. And through proactive networking, he managed to land an internship role, which got converted into a full-time role as well. And finally, I guess um, that would be maybe personal branding, trying to find a way to differentiate yourself from the rest yep. of the graduates, be it local or overseas university. Like, what is what do you have that other people don't? Yeah. Okay. Dokeng? Mm, I think Geraldine's uh, covered most of it. I think uh, the, the answer to the first question is yes, it depends on the employer. So echo what Geraldine said. 
Uh, in terms of the second part of the question as to how private youth students can stand out, I think uh, two main uh, approaches. The first is just focus on doing really well on your first job. Um, there are a lot of companies that, that have uh, no such uh, exclusion policy. And I think a lot of startups, for example, are very happy to recruit based on what you can contribute rather than which school you attended. Um, so one of the best marketers I know comes from a private university and I think he's doing a great job in his current career right now and he's already switched jobs and it's, uh, it's already paying more than his first job. Um, so that's uh, the first approach which is uh, you know just deliver results in your first job uh, then you can uh, use the results from the first job to find better jobs and so on and so forth. The second approach, uh, which might be less popular, is uh, some private university students actually uh, do a, another master's program abroad. Um, and that's a, also another approach uh, to, to kind of uh, rebrand yourself. So those are the two approaches. I have friends who have done both, and both, uh, both approaches, I think, work well. And it really depends on your personal circumstance. OK, Tongi, if I get you to wrap up on your advice on this, I was quite taken by what Geraldine was saying because I, it's like she's got encyclopedia in her brain. <laughs> she doesn't memorize these things. Anyhow, so uh, yeah, I, I, I do think she's covered most bases. Um, and I really would echo even what Dr. Ogun is saying. I think some of the best people I work with today have come from private use. And it will come down to network. Um, I do think the times have changed. Like, all this distinction, maybe it's your mother keep telling you that you know you're you're you cannot, you cannot. <laughs> oh, listen to your mother, la. please. <laughs> change, man. <laughs> mm. I think I I I mean I echoing all three of you, right? I think it's really all in the mind. Like if if you yourself um question yourself, you already set yourself up for failure. And you know, if, if you can't get over yourself yeah, okay. like this, this barrier you have then let alone whatever people think about you you can think the best of you but if you always question yourself then you're not going to get it anyway yeah so i i i i, I that's, that's my own point of view yeah okay so firstly thank you so much we don't go away first so i uh, have to all my viewers who have been watching uh every episode thank you so much and so this is really the final season uh, episode of season two and you know we've had a lot of great shows so this is a compilation of you know kind of all the shows that we've had um, if you're interested do check out our youtube channel as well it's all there we have even the season one stuff there so do 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 go through our youtube channels all of them are over there you know if you missed it uh, too deep for you during some part of the interview just now at uh, the show don't worry you can watch back yeah so that's uh for us for season two so something's brewing so we have something else coming up so don't be too sad if oh no season two is ending so stay tuned and uh thank you again once to all my viewers for the support that we had over this season and we'll see you again very very soon now for today i'd like to say big thanks to my guest uh tongi the co-founder and director of the thought collective Duokeng, the special pro projects lead at Gleans, as well as Geraldine, our very dedicated community member at Seedly. Thank you, the three of you. Uh, I hope my viewers, we've helped you in some way. And you know, don't give up, really. Um, the, the best ones are the ones that keep trying. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.